Let me go just a drop further, and then we'll try to put this story together. Now, uh, what's listed next are Roman numeral 10, our storage vacuoles and vesicles. <laughs> You'd say, say that again. Vacuole and vesicle. <laughs> These are sacks. And some, if the sacks are large, these are sacks for storing or containing chemicals. If they are large in size, they're called a vacuole. If they're small, they're called a vesicle. All right? And so we've listed a number of these vacuoles or vesicles. And in fact, the first one I've listed, and I wrote it to your right, are secretion vesicles. All right, and so now I want to try, before I go any further and read anything more here, I want to try to put this story together. This is page E10 at the top. This is a picture of a typical animal cell. In fact, both the top and bottom pictures on page E10 are typical animal cells, or including human cells. And you'll notice, let's see what we can identify. First of all, remember you've got pictures in brilliant color in your textbook of all these cells and all the parts of the cell in chapter three. But uh, you can see it points to on the right, the cell membrane, the mitochondria, microtubules, the Golgi body, the nucleus, it goes on and on and on. And these are shown in, even nicer in your book. But let's, uh, I want to draw your attention to a few things with this upper picture. First, this is the nucleus. And it's labeled that, nucleus, on the right. You'll notice that there's a nuclear membrane, and on the left-hand side, you can see there are holes or openings in the nuclear membrane. These are called pores or openings through which chemicals can go in or out of the nucleus. You'll notice that inside the nucleus, is a structure called the nucleolus, or nucleolus. And that contains the chemical RNA. Now there's also this jelly-like fluid inside the nucleus called nucleoplasm. So the jelly-like fluid inside the nucleus is called nucleoplasm. And uh, I just wrote that in there. You can too. And uh, we've already mentioned nucleoplasm, like cytoplasm, is mostly water and proteins, having the consistency of jello. In addition, there's DNA in the nucleoplasm. And in fact, you'll notice that uh, it has a label on your picture that says chromatin. You'd say, yeah, what is that? That's the name that we give to DNA when it's uncoiled. So in fact, all right, so this is page uh, E11, and this is uh, a cell right here, and it's showing what can occur inside this cell, this in the form of a flow chart. Now, if you're not familiar with flow charts, they use flow charts for all kinds of subjects nowadays. Flow charts are basically made up of boxes and arrows. And the purpose of the boxes and arrows is to show you a sequence of events. What happens first, what happens second, what happens next. So let's just read what it says in this top left box. It says in the top left box, ribosomes synthesize proteins, right, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And these proteins include enzymes. They include, excuse me, mucus. <laughs> they include hormones, protein hormones, and antibodies. All right, isn't that what we've learned about the ribosomes of the granular ER? Now, let's read what it says in the box right below it. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum synthesizes and stores lipids. These lipids include steroid hormones. Isn't that what we learned about the smooth ER? Now, you'll notice that both boxes the upper one and the lower one have arrows pointing here. Does everybody see that? It's pointing to the middle box of the second column. All right, so what can happen next after either proteins are made in the ribosomes of the rough ER or steroid hormones are made in the smooth ER, what can happen next is that the proteins or lipids can be transferred to the Golgi complex. 
Now the complex, the Golgi complex, sometimes joins carbohydrates to the proteins or to the lipids. So if you were to join a carbohydrate, carbohydrates are sugars, if you joined a sugar, a carbohydrate or sugar to a protein, that would be called a glycoprotein. And we've learned that recognition sites are glycoproteins, for example. So the uh, flat pancake-like sacs of the Golgi complex not only store chemicals, but can modify them as well. Now you'll notice that there's an arrow pointing to the right. So what may happen next is shown in the bottom box of the third uh, column. So what might happen next is that proteins or lipids can be transferred to secretory vesicles. And these vesicles can fuse to the plasma membrane and release their contents to the outside of the cell. And what do we call it when something is released to the outside of the cell? Secretion or exocytosis. Is that pretty much exactly what we've said can happen? Yeah. All right, so let's give you three examples of this. Three examples. I just wrote them right here in this kind of blank space, right on page E11. So, example number one, pancreas cells that secrete insulin. Uh, let's imagine we were looking at a pancreas cell through the microscope. You'd say, I can't imagine that. Okay, let's help you. Turn back to E10. Let's go back to E10. Let's say that this picture on the bottom of E10 is a pancreas cell make, that makes insulin. Where would the insulin be made in this pancreas cell? At the ribosomes of the rough ER. Because insulin is a protein. It's a, pro, a protein hormone. And where would this insulin be temporarily stored in this pancreas cell? Very good, in the Golgi complex. We were learning about Sacs, membranous sacs that store chemicals. If they're large, they're called vacuoles. If they're small, they're called vesicles. And we had talked about, and we had talked about secretion vesicles uh, playing a role in secretion or exocytosis of chemicals from cells. Uh, we had also spoken of food vacuoles that are formed after a cell phagocytoses or swallows up, engulfs, or also known as endocytosis, uh, something. So it forms a food vacuum. And then we had spoken of lysosomes. And we said that lysosomes have this strange nickname, suicide bags, which we're going to get to in just a moment. We said that uh, the uh, lysosomes are formed from the flat pancake-like sacs of the Golgi complex. They contain digestive enzymes, and they fuse with food vacuoles. Now, uh, we actually showed you a picture of this on page uh, E11, uh, on E11. And uh, again, there are resources available showing you all this junk. On, uh, on my uh, website, for example, you can click on... Uh, and uh, uh, let's see, on phagocytosis, I don't even know which video this is. And uh, we can click it, and look at that. Ooh. And here's the lysosome. Everybody see the lysosome? Uniting with the food vacuole, digesting the food. The good, whatever can be used is absorbed into the cell, and whatever can't be is expelled out. So that's exactly what we were talking about. There's other videos. There's a lot of these things. And I put them there for the purpose of making the this. substances taken in by single-celled organisms. Anyhow, there are plenty of resources available, and the point is for you to use them, or, uh, and or your book, and uh, all the other resources. I wanted to uh, raise this question. Since these lysosomes contain these en digestive enzymes that are designed to digest what's in a food vacuole, we might ask, what do you think might happen if a lysosome containing these powerful digestive enzymes ruptured, releasing these enzymes into the cell, what do you think would happen to the cell? The enzymes would digest the entire cell. In other words, it would be, in a sense, committing suicide. So, uh, in fact, if we look right uh, just to the uh, uh, left-hand side, let's enlarge this. 
So it shows uh, what's labeled a living cell, and these are the lysosomes. And if these lysosomes rupture, so they, uh, all these uh, hydrolytic or digestive enzymes are released into the interior of the cell, and the cell self-destructs. And here it shows that happening. It's labeled a dead cell. And this phenomenon uh, of a cell basically committing suicide, uh, the name that uh, the books use is apoptosis. So that is the term that's used in your textbook in chapter uh, three. Uh, and it's also the term used in many of the videos that I've linked. We're going to call it by the name autolysis, which is an easier word to spell and say and explain what it means. Auto autolysis made up of two roots, auto and lysis. Auto means self. Lysis means, of course, to break apart. So literally, putting it together, it means to break apart itself. And so that's uh, what it's called uh, when, it's, uh, when the lysosomes rupture and the cell self-destructs. Now, I want to give you a few examples of when lysosomes actually rupture, causing the cell to break apart. So let's return back uh, to page uh, E3. And back on page E3, under lysosomes, on page E3, so we wrote that the lysosomes can act as suicide bags in programmed cell death or autolysis. And I gave you uh, three examples. I'm actually going to give you four. Okay, the first example I wrote is programmed cell death in the embryonic formation of fingers and toes. And our first thought is, what does that mean? So I want to show you a picture. <clears throat> This is a picture of a human embryo that's five weeks old. In this picture of a human, uh, a baby, uh, 35 days old, it's the end of the fifth week, look at its hands and feet. The hands and feet start out like paddles. There are no fingers or toes. It's all a solid mass of cells. So, and in fact, if we look down here, here you're starting to see fingers and toes form. So how do they form? Literally, there are vertical columns of cells that are genetically programmed to commit suicide. So when a vertical column of cells, the lysosomes rupture, releasing those enzymes, killing the cells, and that creates a separation. And another vertical column of cells commits suicide, creating another separation. And that's how we go from a paddle-like hand or foot to fingers and toes. So this is as known as autolysis, right, uh, of, uh, of breaking apart itself, or programmed cell death. And of course, the gen a program for all this happening, when we say a genetic program, we mean the DNA instructions that are in the cell. So this is actually how it happens. Now sometimes this genetic program is defective. If the genetic program is defective, the person might end up with, it may not form fingers or toes at all, and might be born with a paddle-like hands and feet, or maybe they have only three fingers instead of the normal five on each hand. In fact, it could even be defective where the person ends up with six fingers on each hand and foot instead of the normal five or even seven. So whether somebody has fewer fingers or extra fingers all has to do with whether this is occurring properly. Now, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, one of the interesting things that when a baby is born, for some reason, one of the very first things that almost every mother does when holding that baby for the first time is they pull down the blanket around the baby and they count the fingers and toes. All right? if, you, if you don't believe me, ask your mother. What, just ask. Say that the teacher said at school that it's very common for mothers to count the fingers when their uh, baby is first born. Did you do that? And uh, if, if anybody has children, is that true? Yeah, very true. Well, the first thing you just want to see, are they complete? Are they all there? <laughs> all right? So it's one of the first, you hold the baby, you look at their face, and then you start to look at the, pull down the blanket to see if they've got all their fingers and toes. Yeah, and then you tell your family members he has all then they're all complete. So that's how that works. Now, uh, sometimes uh, whether somebody's born with the wrong number is because of a genetic defect, a defect in the DNA, which they might have inherited, might have, 
Or it could be that there's a defect in this happening because the mother, my battery just went out, because uh, the mother during pregnancy might have been exposed to a harmful chemical. And so uh, women who are pregnant have to be more careful about what they're exposed to uh, because uh, there are various chemicals that can interfere with uh, this normal development. After all, these embryos are really small and very sensitive to chemicals. Interestingly, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, a number of women were prescribed a medication to reduce morning sickness or uh, the nausea that commonly is uh, most women will experience during the first trimester, first three months of pregnancy. Some women experience nausea the entire pregnancy. Uh, this medication was uh, actually made available in most countries of the world, including Britain and Australia and Canada and so on. And they never tested the drug. They tested the drug on women. They found it reduced nausea, but they never tested to see what effect it might have on the babies. There were literally tens of thousands of babies born with deformed arms and legs because it interfered with uh, this normal development. Interestingly, this drug was never approved in the United States. The United States Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, is very strict in its approval of drugs. So are, is this, do you think this ever happens today, where there are medications not available and approved in the United States, but available, let's say, in Canada or especially in Mexico, and people go to other countries or buy these drugs on the Internet all the time? There may be a good reason why these drugs haven't been approved in the United States. The U.S. is very strict because, and basically the only American women who gave birth to deformed thalidomide babies like this are women who went to Canada to get that medication, which was available at the time in Canada. So there were, other than that, there was, it was never approved in the United States. So various medications even can interfere with development. So basically when women are pregnant, they basically, doctors don't want to prescribe anything to them. Now, all they can say you, you can take, you can take a Tylenol, and if you get an, an infection, they'll give you penicillin. But other than that, they won't really give you any medications during pregnancy because they're just always so worried that anything could interfere with the normal development of the baby. Okay, so uh, back on page E3, uh, we gave you the example of, of the role of these autolysis of the lysosomes in uh, the embryonic formation of fingers and toes. A second example that I've listed is atrophy of the uterus during menopause. So let me explain that. First of all, what is menopause? Menopause is something that occurs at about the age of 50 in women. It's when a woman's ovaries stop working. Now, I, uh, I made a little arrow, and I just wrote the following at the bottom of the page. All right, so I drew an arrow here, and you could write what I wrote here. All right, so what did I write? At menopause... You'd say, yeah, what's menopause? Menopause, it occurs at around 50 years of age in women. It's when her ovaries stop working. Now, unlike a guy whose testes function his entire life, he produces testosterone, the male sex hormone, and produces sperm his entire life. A, a, a guy could be 97 years old and still father a child. Uh, women's ovaries stop working at about the age of 50, sometimes a couple years earlier, sometimes a couple years later. Uh, now, when a woman's ovaries stop working, well, we mean they stop working. They stop secreting estrogen, the female sex hormone, and they stop ovulating, they stop releasing eggs. So this is known as the reproductive biological clock in women. It doesn't exist in men. This actually makes women more serious about their life than men. I've talked about that before. Remember, a 20-year-old woman is getting serious about her life. A 20-year-old boy is, has clueless as far as what life is about. All right. So um, what happens, therefore, is the drop in the estrogen hormone level. Now, this drop in the estrogen hormone level, because the ovaries are no longer producing estrogen, causes a number of changes in a woman's body. And it causes changes in her skin. It causes changes in her bones. Her bones become more likely to develop uh, osteoporosis, weakness uh, of the uh, bones. And it causes other changes. Now, one of the other changes that it causes, women don't really care that much about, but that's why I'm mentioning it. The drop in the estrogen hormone level triggers or causes autolysis in the cells of a woman's uterus. You'd say, what was autolysis again? Uh, it literally means to break apart itself. 
the lysosomes rupture and the uterine cells self-destruct. So the whole uterus, as a result, atrophies. The word atrophy means to shrink. So the uterus shrinks because a woman is not going to carry, she's not going to get pregnant now, she's not going to carry a child because her ovaries don't work anymore. All right? So the uterus shrinks. Now, most women really don't care that much that their uterus is shrinking. In fact, some women are almost relieved that they don't no longer have to deal with menstrual periods, uh, which we'll get into later in the course. But uh, the, the word atrophy means shrinking. You've heard that word atrophy. Some of you might say, I never heard of it. If you don't use your muscles, what happens to your muscles if you don't use them? They shrink. They atrophy. All right? So in this case, we're not talking about somebody's arm muscles atrophying or shrinking because of lack of exercise. We're talking about a woman's uterus shrinking. Interestingly, uh, what they used to do up until about 10 years ago, 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago at the most, is when women would approach uh, 50 years of age, the uh, uh, gynecologists, which are doctors for women's reproductive issues, uh, would prescribe uh, estrogen. This was known as hormone replacement therapy. And they would prescribe estrogen, and that would prevent these changes from occurring. In other words, it would prevent the changes in skin and uh, the changes in uh, developing osteoporosis of the bones. And also, it would prevent the uterus from shrinking, not that anybody cared. Now, taking estrogen didn't, uh, doesn't make the ovaries work, so a woman still couldn't get pregnant after the age of 50. It just prevented some of the physical changes that occurred. However, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, a large clinical study was done that showed that in a small percent of women taking estrogen after menopause, a small percent of women, probably less than 2% of every, all the women taking it, uh, had an increased risk of dying from strokes uh, and other cardiovascular problems by taking estrogen postmenopausally. For that reason, most gynecologists either stopped prescribing estrogen in postmenopausal women entirely or will only prescribe very, very low doses. So today, women can take other medications to prevent osteoporosis or weakening of their bones. You've heard the commercials done by Sally Field for Boniva and Fosamax and so on, uh, but they no longer really prescribe estrogen. Uh, and that was because of some side effects that are found in some women. All right, but anyhow, the point that we, uh, we're just talking about a lot of different things, but what's uniting all these things I'm mentioning is the role of lysosomes uh, acting as suicide bags to cause cells to self-destruct. Three, I want to give you one last example. I don't think it's written there, but I've written it in. So I wrote letter D, visualize autolysis in cells infected with a virus. So in fact, when a virus enters human cells, infecting them, our body has to destroy these viral particles. We don't even have effective antiviral drugs. So one of the ways that our body causes these cells in our body that have become infected with the virus is that the lysosomes rupture, releasing those hydrolytic enzymes destroying the cell and any viral particles within it. So in fact, what our body does is it basically causes our own, some of our own cells that are infected with the virus to self-destruct. And that takes out the cell, but it also takes out the viruses that are inside the cell at the same time. And then we make new cells to take the place of those that have been self-destructed. The point here is this. Well, the reason why there's so much emphasis in modern biology on cells is because this is how we explain everything. So you can see these silly little structures called lysosomes, and we're thinking, come on, is, this is like boring, who cares? I just, just used lysosomes to explain how fingers form in a, in a em human embryo, how the womb of a, a woman atrophies or shrinks at menopause, and how the cells that are infected with the virus self-destruct to destroy the virus in our body. Okay, that takes us to mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are found in uh, cells. They're found in uh, plant cells and animal cells, both. And uh, they are nicknamed the powerhouses of the cell. Now, what's going on inside the mitochondria is a process called cellular respiration. 
But cellular respiration is the name of this process by which that gasoline called ATP is produced. So the production of this gasoline or high energy nucleotide called ATP uh, it occurs largely in the mitochondria of the cell. Let's look at a few pictures. So on the bottom picture, this is an animal cell. It could also be a human cell. And you can see right here, labeled on the bottom right of E10, is a mitochondria. So they're found in plant cells, they're found in animal cells. Let's look at an enlarged view, Let's, so we can see this even better. This shows an enlarged view of a mitochondria, kind of a three-dimensional view. And a mitochondrion is characterized It's characterized by having an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Incidentally, outer is just one T. <laughs> so it has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Right? So there's the outer membrane. The inner membrane has folded. You can see it has inner folds of the inner membrane. So it's folded. Now, it shows in this picture a whole bunch of little speckles or dots all over the inner membrane. Those speckles or spots represent enzymes. So there's a whole bunch of enzymes on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Now, we know that enzymes are proteins that catalyze biochemical reactions. So there must be a lot of biochemical reactions occurring, especially on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Now, in fact, the process that is occurring here, and I know that this looks like a mess, so don't worry about it. I'm going to walk you through all of this. Let's try to make it a little bit cleaner here as far as focusing. So what is occurring in the mitochondria is called cellular respiration. Now, the overall process of cellular respiration is what I've written. In cellular respiration, sugars such as glucose, C6H12O6, are broken apart using six molecules of oxygen, or O2. Now, there, there's really a whole lot of enzymes involved in breaking apart the sugar with oxygen. So it involves many, many enzymes for this process called cellular respiration. The sugars are broken apart with oxygen into six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. And in the process of breaking apart the sugar, energy is released. And that energy that's released is used to make 38 molecules of ATP. Now some books will say 36, but the point is we make all this gasoline called ATP. Uh, we had written that uh, cells vary in their number of mitochondria. Uh, for example, in skin cells of our body, they have very few mitochondria. On the other hand, in muscle cells of our body, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands. How many mitochondria are found in a cell is an indication of how much energy it requires, because that's where this gasoline called ATP is made. So clearly, there's a lot of mitochondria in muscle cells because muscle cells require a lot more gasoline in the form of ATP to allow us to exercise and run uh, compared to what skin cells need. So uh, very curiously, we wrote that mitochondria contain their own DNA. Now we've learned that there's DNA in the nucleus of a cell, but now we're telling you there's also what is called mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria of the cell. I'll more to say about that later. And the last few structures we're going to tackle kind of simultaneously. And these are centrioles, flagella, and cilia. Okay, this is page E4. Now, the centrioles we wrote are found only in animal cells, and they are involved in cell division. They are made up of microtubules and specifically a ring of nine sets of microtubules that are capable of contracting. All right? Then, a flagella or cilia. Yes, sir, are you going to clarify that? Yes, I am. The flagellum is a whip-like tail that is made up of nine paired sets of protein cylinders or microtubules plus one pair in the center. You say, I don't get that. 
We're going to see a picture of this in a moment. It looks like this. This is nine pairs of microtubular proteins, tube-shaped proteins, with a, two, a pair in the center. This is known as a 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. All right, and then a cilia. Cilia are fine motile hairs that are organized just like flagellum. All right, well here, let's try to clarify some of this. First, let's start with a flagellum. A flagellum is a tail. I wrote that right here. So, an example of a flagellated cell, a cell that has a flagellum, are human sperm. The flagellum acts like a tail, and it moves. And as it moves, it propels the sperm through a fluid environment. All right? Now, uh, this shows a paramecium, which we've seen pictures of before. And paramecium is a single-celled organism, a protozoan, that has little cilia. Now, really, what cilia are is like short flagellum. It's like a little tiny short flagellum. And they move. So we can see that flagellum, which create movement, and cilia, which create movement, are all associated with movement. Let's take a look at some pictures of this. On the bottom left on E12, so it shows a flagellated cell. Could be a sperm. Could be another cell that's flagellated. Sperm are not the only flagellated cells. They're only human flagellated cells, but there are all kinds of single-celled organisms that have flagella. And uh, if we made a cross-section to see what's inside the flagella, it would look like this. It would have nine pairs of microtubules around the perimeter plus two in the center. It would look like this model. This is called a nine plus two array or arrangement of microtubules. Now, these are cilia. Cilia uh, are like short flagella. If we made a cross-section through them, it would look absolutely identical to the inside of a flagella, a 9 plus 2 arrangement. So the, what, uh, what, creates, uh, what allows a flagellum to move, or cilia to move, is that these microtubule-shaped proteins move. That is the basic unit of movement. We actually learned about microtubules previously on page, I believe it was uh, E1. Uh, or uh, uh, E2, I'm sorry, page E2, where we talked about cytoplasm and we said in the cytoplasm there are microtubular shaped proteins and microfilamentous proteins. And the tubule shaped ones create movement. Now, um, <clears throat> what, uh, just above is a centriole. Uh, I didn't bring my model of a centriole, but a centriole looks very similar to uh, a flagellum or a cilium. It has nine sets of microtubules around the perimeter, but it's missing the pair in the center. This is called a nine plus zero arrangement. Now, my, uh, the centrioles are structures that are involved in creating movement in animal cells when they divide. So in a lab class, you learn that when you learn about how cells divide, you learn that in animal cells, including human cells, there are these centrioles that form these microtubules that extend between the centrioles. Uh, uh, this is part of what's called the mitotic apparatus inside of an animal cell. And these microtubules actually pull the chromatids or DNA molecules apart during cell division. So, uh, let's, let's go back to E4. Back on page E4, what's the point we're trying to make? Centrioles, which are found only in animal cells, create movement. They are involved in movement during cell division, at least in animal cells. They, uh, it's these microtubules that create movement. The flagellum, there are cells, including human sperm, that have a tail or flagellum that moves, and what's inside them are microtubules. There are cells that have cilia, that, uh, and uh, these cilia are like little hairs that move, and what's inside them are microtubules. So clearly, the basic unit of movement are microtubules inside the flagellum, inside the cilia, or inside the centriole. Now, uh, just before we leave this, 
There are, we've already mentioned the, uh, an example of a human cell that it, it has a flagellum, our sperm. And incidentally, the purpose of the cilia in our airways is not to make the cells move, but to push dust and foreign matter out of our airways to keep them clean. So the cells, the ciliated cells that line our trachea, our, our, uh, our windpipe, that line our bronchi and bronchioles, they have cell cilia, and these cilia move back and forth to push the microscopic dust and foreign matter that we've inhaled. Every time we inhale, it pushes it back up out of the airways, up into our throat. You can imagine, every time we inhale, the amount of little tiny microscopic bits of dust that we end up inhaling. So we've got to keep our airways clean. Now you might say, well, if the cilia push it up into our throat, what do we do then? We do one of two things. We either go and spit it out, or we swallow it. And whatever we swallow, if it's just dust and stuff, it'll come out in our feces or stool. But the idea is to keep our lungs clean. Now, a second place where we have ciliated cells, and I don't think any of you would have guessed this unless you've learned it, is in the fallopian tubes of a woman. Now, the fallopian tubes are also known as the oviducts. We're looking at the female reproductive system. This is the female reproductive system. And so what we have here is these are the ovaries. Here's an ovary. Here's an ovary. This ovary on your right is actually a cutaway view. And we can even see an egg popping out. When an egg pops out, that's called ovulation. Now, uh, these are the fallopian tubes, or oviducts. <clears throat> and uh, normally, when this egg pops out, it actually enters the fallopian tube. Now, your question might be, well, if the egg comes out here, how the hell does it get over to the fallopian tube? In real life, these fallopian tubes are attached to the ovaries. So in this picture, they drew the fallopian tubes pulled away from the ovaries, but in real life, they are actually attached to the ovary. So when that egg pops out of the ovary, it enters the fallopian tube. Interestingly, though, an egg cannot move on its own. A sperm can, but not an egg. This egg that enters the fallopian tube and pops out is going to be pushed by ciliated cells lining the inside of the fallopian tube. So there are the cells that line the inside of the fallopian tube slowly but surely push that egg through the fallopian tube towards the uterus or womb. The uterus is the womb. Now it takes about a week for this egg to be pushed through the fallopian tube to the uterus. That is the one week out of every month where a woman can get pregnant. A woman cannot get pregnant when the egg is still inside her ovary. And but that egg only lives about one week, and then it dies. Sperm will live about three days inside of a woman's body, and then they die. But the egg will only live about a week, really less than a week. So if a woman's going to get pregnant, she actually, the sperm, the only place where she can get pregnant is where the sperm unites with the egg as the egg is being slowly pushed through the fallopian tube in the direction of the uterus. So in fact, let's look at L9. On L9, page L9, so here it shows exactly what we said on L9. The egg is being fertilized by a sperm in the fallopian tube. That's where fertilization or conception usually occurs. That forms a zygote, a fertilized egg, and it starts to develop a two-celled embryo, a four-celled embryo, an eight-celled embryo. And again, the embryo cannot move on its own either. It's being pushed by ciliated cells that line the inside of the fallopian tube. <clears throat> it, again, whether it's the egg or whether it's the embryo, it is being pushed through the fallopian tube. And if it's an embryo, once it reaches the uterus, it will implant in the inner lining of the uterus. The inner lining of the uterus is called the endometrium. Endo means inner, metrium means uterus. 
the embryo will implant in the inner lining of the uterus, the endometrium, and it will be nourished by blood vessels in the endometrium of the uterus. Now, one last thing here. Uh, has anybody ever heard of something called a tubal pregnancy? So, just to write down the term, tubal pregnancy, also known as an ectopic pregnancy. Now, what's that? Imagine if the egg gets fertilized, so we have an embryo, but what if there's no ciliated cells? What if the cells lining the fallopian tube either do not have cilia, or the cilia simply don't function? So then, there's no cilia to push the embryo to the uterus, and it just starts to develop right there in the fallopian tube. Now, they have to terminate this pregnancy, abort it, because obviously uh, the, the fallopian tube is not designed to accommodate a baby to grow in it, and it was just going to rupture the fallopian tube, causing hemorrhaging or bleeding, and the embryo is not going to be able to survive anyhow. So uh, one of the possible causes of a tubal pregnancy is not having those ciliated cells or cells with functional cilia. So, in summarizing today, we were talking about uh, uh, microtubules just now. Microtubules are the basic unit of movement that are.